So I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody to the Japanese American National Museum. And you know, I'm really thrilled uh, to introduce today's program because we will learn about a part of history that has received little attention. But it is so important, especially in the context of democracy and the fragility of democracy. So we're sitting in Japanese American National Museum's National Center for the Preservation of Democracy, which is designed to explore issues of race, identity, social justice, and democracy. And US Senator Daniel Inoue envisioned the NCPD as a place to illustrate democracy in action. So beyond the betrayal, the memoir of a World War II Japanese American draft resistor of conscience, by Yoshito Kuromiya uh, allows us to have that conversation um, and really illustrates democracy in action. It is the only book length memoir written by a draft resistor of conscience. And Kuromiya resisted the military draft on the grounds that the US government had deprived him and his family of his fundamental rights as an American citizen. So we are delighted to have and are grateful to Gail Kurumiya and the Kurumiya family for making this event happen at the Japanese American National Museum. I also want to acknowledge uh, Takashi Hoshizaki. Are you here today? So Takashi is another draft resistor of conscience who is here today and will be joining us uh, in the Q&A at the end. I also want to thank uh, Lawson Inada for joining us today. Lawson is the preeminent Japanese American poet who has promoted the significance of the draft, draft resistor movement, and he wrote the forward and afterward of Beyond the Betrayal. So, and, and Lawson has published numerous books, including Legends from Camp, and I consider Lawson to be my literary father. Uh, so when I was an undergraduate and when I was receiving my Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing, there were so few API writers and poets that I went back to Lawson's work over and over again. So he's been a big influence uh, on my career. So we are lucky to have him here today. Uh, and I'm pleased to introduce Art Hansen. So I first met Art back in the 1990s when I asked him to write an article for a publication related to a project I did in Arizona called Transforming Barbed Wire. Um, he has been one of the leading scholars of Japanese American history. And he is an emeritus professor of history and founding director of the Japanese American Project of the Oral History Program and the Center for Oral and Public History at Cal State University Fullerton. Uh, he has been a senior historian at the Japanese American National Museum, and we continually go to art for guidance uh, with his expertise. He has received the Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association uh, for Asian American Studies, and also the Sue Kunitomi Embry Legacy Award from the Manzanar Committee in 2014. He is also the author of Barbed Voices, Oral History, Resistance, and the World War II Japanese American Social Disaster. And he's the editor of the Nisei Naysayer, the memoir of militant Japanese American journalist Jimmy Omura. But today, uh, he is joining us as the editor of Beyond the Betrayal. So please welcome Art Hansen. Please tell me if my voice is carrying through. Is it OK? Good, thank you. Thanks so much, Rick, for your very, very kind introduction. Uh, I enjoyed knowing Rick when he was working with the transforming barbed wire thing. And most of my responsibility was with the Gila camp, uh, writing a piece on that and leading a, a tour through the camp with one of the former uh, inmates of that particular uh, camp. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you, whether in person or online who, who, online, who constitute the audience for this launching of Yosh Koromiya's book, Beyond the Betrayal, the memoir of a World War II Japanese American draft resistor of conscience, which I have had the privilege of editing for publication by the University Press of Colorado. 
a very, very few of the 300-some imprisoned World War II Japanese Americans who in 1944 resisted being drafted into the U.S. Army from behind barbed wire, barbed wire American-style concentration camps have reflected in print on their experience. In fact, one of them who has done so has already been inter introduced to you, Takashi Hoshizaki, who is with us here today. Let's acknowledge him again, okay? Okay. However, Beyond the Betrayal is the only book-length account devoted to that still quite contentious historical event. If and when you purchase a copy of Beyond the Betrayal, please note the important role played in it by three activist individuals, Frank Chin, Eric Muller, and Lawson Anata, who were not only close friends and ideological allies of Coromia, but also were responsible themselves for authoring groundbreaking literary works about the subject of the World War II draft resistance movement by conscience-bound Americans of Japanese ancestry. In the case of Frank Chin, he granted me permission to utilize a quoted passage from his epic 2002 documentary novel, Born in the USA, as the epigraph for Beyond the Betrayal. Let us now hear its words and ponder its profound meaning. The war challenged Japanese Americans to justify themselves before an America more interested in revenge against the Japanese enemy than in the emerging minority just entering its second generation. The question is, did it emerge? As for Eric Muller, the author of an authoritative and comprehensive 2001 history of the World War II Japanese American draft resistors, ingeniously entitled Free to Die for Their Country, he provided the preface for Beyond the Betrayal. It begins with this message. The book you are holding is an important document. It then goes on to make this declaration. What is special about this memoir is that it is a detailed account from within the penetrating narrative of the draft resistance movement at the Heart Mountain concentration camp in Northwest Wyoming from the perspective of a thoughtful and brilliant man who actually participated in it. In addition, Eric generously permitted me to draw upon his legal acumen as a professor in jurisprudence and ethics at the University of North Carolina School of Law to correct some significant factual errors in Coromia's autobiographical account. With respect to Lawson Anata, Oregon's Poet Laureate from 2006 to 2010, he supplied Beyond the Betrayal's lyrical forward. Here are its captivating words. From out of the abuses, from out of the cruelties, from out of the losses, from out of the tragedies, emerges this lucid voice of this honorable person. Lawson also consented to my request to utilize his powerful Drawing the Line poem, which he dedicated to Cormier in his 1997 book by the same title as the afterword for Beyond the Betrayal. Later in today's presentation, we will be favored by hearing Lawson deliver a select portion of this masterwork in his uniquely resonant voice. My major role as the editor of Yosh Cormier's memoirs was to write its introductory essay. In reading Beyond the Betrayal through countless times, I was prompted to classify it as being a transformational memoir. I arrived at this designation because its dominant theme is clearly how, during Kurumiya's lifetime, he repeatedly overcame challenging circumstances, the most significant of them by far being his 1944 decision as a World War II Japanese American inmate at Wyoming's Heart Mountain concentration camp to resist the draft. What struck me very powerfully during my immersion in Beyond the Betrayal was how its pages were suffused with three salient and often interwoven components of Coromia's character, consciousness, conscience, and constitutionalism. It was this finding that helped me to realize just why Beyond the Betrayal is so especially well-suited to convey to the public the generic plight of all 300-some Nisei draft resistors, notwithstanding that each resistor's experience is necessarily distinctive. While eluding precise definition, consciousness has been characterized as the state or quantity of being aware of an external object or something within itself, or put a slightly different way, as the fact of awareness by the mind of itself in the world. 
and respect the consciousness, although Coromia does not mention this word per se until chapter 10 of his memoir, upon reading the four-paragraph segment of his initial chapter about the first days he spent in August 1942 as a Heart Mountain inmate, we are made acutely mindful that our narrator is a complex person, both a writer and an artist, one who assays his surroundings, scrutinizes his place and that of others within them, and explores the nexus between these two processes. As in a strange dream, records Cormea, my citizenship had vanished, and in its place were rows upon rows of tar-papered barracks encircled by a barbed wire fence with guard towels at intervals, manned by armed soldiers barely visible in the wind-driven dust. It was all so surreal, I wasn't sure what to make of it. Fortunately for readers, the stream of such manifest consciousness as revealed in this passage permeates the remaining pages of Coromia's evocative memoir. While direct and indirect references to consciousness and beyond the betrayal are few in number, they are nonetheless quite significant in illuminating how exceedingly Coromia prized this quality. For example, when writing about the new consciousness, consciousness of the so-called Age of Aquarius, of the 1960s, he links this epic to, quote, a revolutionary transformation of man's collective conscious, end quote. And he foretells that this development would be, quote, a long, arduous one with no turning back. In terms of his education and career as a landscape architect, Cormier became convinced that environmental consciousness was everyone's responsibility and that the landscape architect must play a pivotal role in bringing about that awareness in his work. At one point in his life, too, Coromia became intensely interested in a group called the Prosperos, whose members believe that God is pure consciousness, arguably the reference in his memoir that best penetrates to this core significance of consciousness for him, relates to his postal and telephone exchanges with his much admired friend Michi Nishiura Weglin, author of the 1976 classic book, Years of Infamy. This, 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 uh, exchange occurred in the months just prior to her 1999 death, recalls Kermia, quote, We agreed that our spiritual nature was our true identity and that our physical manifestation was the means through which we relate to the dimensional world that is essentially an illusion. Illusions end once they serve their purpose in the dimensional realm, and the spirit moves on to further enhance universal consciousness, end quote. While consciousness was assuredly the backdrop milieu and psychological precondition for everything that transpired in, in Kuramiya's creative life, including the writing of his memoir, what assumes the foreground and beyond the betrayal is his fierce allegiance to conscience and constitutionalism. As for, as for conscience, it has been ordinarily construed to mean the inner sense of what is right or wrong in one's conduct or motives impelling one toward right action. For Koromiya, conscience was modeled for him by his father, Hizumitsu, who never preached virtue but merely followed his conscience. This then was the family legacy that Koromiya inherited to utilize throughout his life as his own conscience dictated, coming increasingly to believe that, quote, one's conscience is a sense the language of one's soul, end quote. He drew on failing upon his conscience during the darkest days of his imprisonment at Heart Mountain in the McNeil Island Penitentiary when it was his, quote, constant companion and solitary counsel, end quote. On one occasion and beyond the betrayal, Coromia utilizes the term conscience in the service of a species of gallows humor that bears upon his imprisonment and that of the other Japanese-American draft resistors and conscientious objectors at the McNeil Island prison. One morning, Coromia recollects, the warden arrived to find a large banner strung across the second-story dorm window which read, if Warden Stevens had a conscience, he would be a CO, conscientious objector. He, the warden immediately ordered the confinement to the doors of all the COs, which was about one-fourth of our population. He then questioned them all individually. One CO later told us that he had asked the warden why he was accusing only the COs, and the warden retorted angrily, you're the only bastards on this island who know how to spell conscience. <laughs> Cormier's other references to conscience in his memoir are anything but a laughing matter. 
For example, he relates that when in early 1940 at Heart Mount, 1944 at Heart Mount, he was informed that the U.S. government had changed his draft classification along with that of other Nisei from 4C, enemy alien ineligible for conscription, to 1A, eligible for conscription. He was glad that he was, quote, no longer considered sinister, unquote, but was dismayed that the restatement, reinstatement of his civil rights had not accompanied this change of draft status. He thus became determined that, quote, he could not in good conscience bear arms under the existing conditions, end quote. In his epilogue, Koromiya first applauds three special Japanese Americans with whom he interacted and intently admired for exercising their conscience and refusing to remain silent in the face of oppression. James Jimmy Omura, Michi Nishiura Weglin and Aaron Watada. He then roundly condemns the leadership of the Japanese American Citizen League. To his mind, the JACL owed an apology to the entire Japanese American community for, quote, falsely claiming, unquote, to represent their interest while in actuality, quote, conspiring to surrender our civil and human rights, end quote. Moreover, when JCL leaders urged the mandatory induction of male Japanese Americans from behind the barbed wire of their wartime concentration camps under, quote, the pretext of proving their loyalty, end quote, it effectively prevented each man from exercising his right as a citizen, quote, to serve or not according to his conscience, end quote. With respect to constitutionalism, this word essentially describes one's belief in and support for the basic principles and laws of a nation or state that determine the powers and duties of the government and guarantee certain designated rights to the people. In his memoir, Koromiya never refers to the specific term of constitutionalism, but it is pervasively evoked by him through other words with a common base, such as constitution, constitutionality, constitutional, and unconstitutional. In one chapter of his memoir alone, he makes two extended references to constitutionalism. Constitutionalism. The first of these discusses his response to a key question on the highly controversial and contested loyalty questionnaire administered to all Japanese American adult inmates in early 1943 by the U.S. government and endorsed by the JACL leadership. He explains that his answer to question 27, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered, was a conditional yes, the condition being that he first be accorded equal constitutional rights as Caucasian American citizens. The other reference made by Cormier in this chapter related to his early 1944 attendance at a mess hall meeting of the newly formed Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee. He recounts that he was, quote, unquote, captivated by its chair, the middle-aged Nisei from Hawaii, Kiyoshi Okamoto, not merely because of his direct demeanor and, quote, unquote, brutally crude language laced with expletives, but also and perhaps chiefly because, quote, he seemed to have an impressive knowledge of constitutional law indispensable in any civil rights forum, end quote. During his attendance at future FPC meetings, Kuramiya came to respect the other members of the group's steering committee, seeing them as principled men, quote, who knowingly jeopardized their own and their families' welfare in any effort in, to regain dignity, if not justice, for all inmates, end quote. Thus, on or about March 16, 1944, and not altogether surprisingly, when Kuramiya received his notice to report for his physical exam prior to induction, he refused to comply. This message reverberated in his mind. No, this is my country. This is my constitution. This is my Bill of Rights. I am here finally to defend them. I regret that I had surrendered my freedom. I shall not continue to surrender my dignity or the dignity of the U.S. Constitution. Instead of talking about Kuramiya, though, it's now time to come face to face with the man himself and his opinions via film. Thanks to Fra Frank Abe's interview with Cormier in August 1993 for use in the then in process film Conscience and the Constitution, we're able, through the permission of Dencho's video archives, to view two brief clips from that interview. In both of them, Cormier discusses his 1944 rationale for, uh, for resisting the draft into the U.S. Army. Uh, in addition, thanks to the generosity of filmmaker Robert Soji, Shoji, who is with us today, we have the opportunity to view his short 2020 film entitled A Hero's Hero. It features both Kuromiya and his nephew, Kiyoshi Kuromiya, a pioneering civil rights activist in the African-American and gay communities. Fortunately, 
as I say, Robert is, is with us here today, and I'd like to have him uh, acknowledge. Roger, Roger uh, has, uh, Robert has a new film out right now, and the whole film is devoted to Kuyoshi Kurumiya. And right now, uh, where, where are you, uh, 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 Curtis Nakagawa, where are you? Uh, would, you would you say w w how he has appeared today to you? Uh, I noticed that if you look at Google, you can see a, a picture, I think that's of his nephew, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a big honor, I think. I think so, too. Okay, I guess we're ready for the for the uh, the film clips and then the uh, the, uh, the hero's hero uh, documentary. Why did you exist? I didn't feel there was really a choice. That, um, as an American citizen, that um, we all had an ob obligation, a responsibility uh, to. publicize or to raise the issue of the incarceration, the uh, evacuation at whatever opportunity we had. This certainly presented an opportunity, one that um, uh, if we were to overlook it at this point, then we virtually accept the evacuation as a normal condition. Why? Why protest or why resist in that way that puts you at risk of going to prison or being shot or going to prison for 50 years? Somebody had to say something. You were willing. You were willing to go to jail for 50 years. For whatever, we didn't expect 50 years, but uh, that wasn't uh, outside the realm of possibility. Or to be even shot, for that matter. Can you tell me, uh, like we talked about before, what, what, what were some of the more, well, what were some of the ways that some of the guys tried to dodge the draft without protesting? Well, I think one of the more popular methods was uh, to tr drink a lot of shoyu, and uh, presumably that raised the blood pressure so that they could never pass the physical. Why didn't you do that? As I said before, it's, um, we saw this as an opportunity to raise the issue, not to just get out of the draft, just to save our own necks. That um, uh, I was uh, uh, certainly uh, somewhat um, disappointed that uh, my number came up <laughs> in the initial stages of this whole thing, so I was, I was picked, you know, I was certainly hoping it would happen to somebody else instead of me, uh, but uh, uh, since I was called, I, I could see no other choice, but uh, uh, felt that um, at least I have an opportunity to uh, state the case. Uh, after, the, after the trial, when the, when the conviction came down, how did you feel about the verdict? Of course I was downhearted because uh, there, there was a very slim ray of hope that uh, uh, if we were exonerated, then of course uh, that would uh, uh, give, uh, make great strides in uh, the publicity alone of that setting a precedent would uh, pretty much uh, take care of a lot of this. Of course, it wouldn't uh, uh, conclude the issue completely, but uh, it would certainly help. Was it worth it? Looking oh, yes. 50 years? Oh, yes. Very much so. Uh, um, not knowing it at the time, in retrospect, I think it's one of the more decent things I did in my life.
A couple of years ago, I was invited by my friend Susie Ling to document a visit to Monrovia by Yosh Kuromiya. Yosh had a fascinating life, so I was looking forward to meeting him and hearing his story. But what I ended up learning from Yosh was much more than I had expected. That's our house. That oh, gosh, guy, it you looks, it. It 609, looks, right yeah, here. it looks pretty good now. Yeah. It didn't look like this, huh? Oh, hell, they fixed it up nice. I still remember the uh, the street number. In the 1930s, at Yosha's childhood home, he and his family suffered the harsh reality of neighborhood racial segregation. We were on California, just south of Colorado, uh, just two houses uh, south of Colorado, and we didn't belong there. But, you know, I didn't know that until, you know, our neighbors tried to sell their house and, uh, you know, prospective buyers uh, weren't sure about the Japs that lived next door. The whole issue uh, came up in the Monrovia Council, so it was in the newspapers and uh, we got evicted from our house. When World War II broke out, the Kuromiya family was living in Monrovia. As a teenager, Yosh learned that all people of Japanese descent living on the West Coast would be placed into U.S.-style concentration camps. Yosh and his family were sent to the Heart Mountain Relocation Center in Wyoming. While at Heart Mountain, Yosh received his draft notice. But when they tried to draft us out of the camps. That's where I drew the line because I shouldn't have to prove my loyalty. They took away my citizenship rights. You know, the government and the people, the public, created that situation as a result of the uh, war propaganda. And the more I researched, the more I realized that that was the reality due to wartime hysteria. We were robbed. On principle, Yosh resisted the draft and was sent to the Cheyenne County Jail and then served two years in a federal prison on McNeil Island. In 2000, the National Japanese American Citizens League, after three decades of heated internal debate, passed a resolution apologizing to the Nisei draft resistors for not acknowledging their principled stand during the war. All the way up uh -huh. to the during our drive around Monrovia, we decided to take a bit of a detour and visit Yoshi's nephew, Kiyoshi Kuromiya. He's about the, on the first row, south. He's way up there. Yeah, he's about, mm, let me see, what is that? Well, maybe he's about the fourth, fourth, fourth. Yeah. down. So you said that you and Kiyoshi were very close. You know, considering that uh, 
we were seldom able to meet because, you know, he was in Philadelphia. But when he was working with uh, Buckminster Fuller, uh, he used to come to the West Coast. Uh, he'd, he'd stop by a few times and, uh, you know, he had, he had so many stories to tell about his adventures that, you know, he, he was fascinating, uh, but he had an aura about him, a, a kind of assurance uh, and whatever he did, he was very positive, uh, nothing frightened him and he would dare to do things that most people would hesitate, uh, like myself, you know. I was amazed at uh, his, you know, confidence and courage. Kiyoshi Kuromiya was a Japanese-American author and civil rights and anti-war activist. Born at the Heart Mountain Relocation Center in Wyoming, Kuromiya became an aide to Martin Luther King Jr. and helped take care of King's children immediately following his assassination. In 1962, I was <clears throat> very active in the civil rights movement. Well, I was standing about 100 feet in front of Martin Luther King when he made his I Have a Dream speech. And, of course, these kinds of experiences are bound to inspire and to influence. And um, that night, uh, Mark Crawford and I went to the Willard Hotel to meet with uh, uh, James Baldwin, who was staying there with uh, his friend Etienne. And uh, we met uh, uh, King and Abernathy in the lobby. That was the first time I met King. I'd worked with him later in the civil rights movement uh, in Selma and Montgomery. Kiyoshi was one of the handful of Asian Americans who went to Selma to fight for African American civil rights. Um, I was leading a, um, a march of black high school students on the state capitol building in Montgomery uh, for, uh, for voter registration because, you know, it was 1965, and if you were black, you could not vote in Alabama. So uh, the sheriff's volunteer posse, I'm sure there are other names for it, but that's what they called it at the time, attacked me against a wall. I was clubbed down. I uh, had 22 stitches down my head. The last people saw me, I was soaked down to the waist in a bloody shirt and was dragged off to the hospital. Kiyoshi is perhaps best known as the founder of the Critical Path Project newsletter. The Critical Path newsletter one of the earliest and most comprehensive sources of HIV treatment information, was routinely mailed to thousands of people living with HIV all over the world. He was a, an extraordinary person. Did you look up to Kiyoshi? Was he kind of a mentor to you at some point? Oh, yeah. Even though you were his uncle? Oh, yeah. Very much so. You know, I, I have total respect for him, more so than any other person that I've met, simply because Kiyoshi wasn't doing it for the glory or the money. You know, his commitment was total. It's not often that you get the chance to meet someone who was such an important figure in the history of the Japanese American experience. I felt lucky to have met Yosh and to have learned about his nephew Kiyoshi. I only wish I could have met him too.
The next item on our agenda is the privilege of hearing one of the leading Japanese American poets of our time, Lawson Anata, reading aloud for us in his signature voice a plentiful section of his majestic 1997 poem, Drawing the Line, which, as earlier noted, he dedicated to Yosh Koromiya. Lawson? Thank you, Art. I'll tell you, I was thinking, I don't know where we'd be uh, uh, with, Art, with the work of Art Hansen. And so, uh, really now, let's hear it for Art. <clears throat> if, we had a, if we had a Mount Rushmore at this uh, museum, Art would certainly be on it. He'd be a very prominent figure. I mean, and I was trying to figure out what... Uh, why have we depended so much on, on art? And I think part of the problem is that for those of us who went through the camp experience, it was so, such a difficult time. And then in a way, for a person like me who was uh, born before the camps and went through the camps and then came out, uh, there's much to talk about how the recovery period was kind of like an extended camp period, and you know, it was a very rough time. And so it wasn't easy for us just to waltz into academia and start and start uh, looking at our own history. And so I think that's one thing that uh, that uh, we can continue to do. Boy, it sure is inspiring to see uh, the work that uh, came up before us on the screen. And uh, it made me feel like, boy, what else... What else can be done? And I think uh, uh, everyone in here can can do something. And maybe one way you could do something is to perhaps uh, help organize a kind of a follow-up to this event. I think this event is the first. Uh, it's not just a thing that's uh, the book is out and it's over and uh, it's all over. I think in the spirit of, uh, of the book and the work, I think everybody could be involved in uh, somewhere down the line, you know, maybe there could be a, a, a reconvening or, or, or some kind of uh, some kind of event that allows us to get together and then hear different sides of uh, whatever stories we're dealing with. So I think we can use the, this museum as a, as a as a home for that kind of a discussion, because I'm interested in uh, uh, everybody's story. I think everybody's got a story. I'm trying to figure you out. And uh, <clears throat> for instance, in my own ignorance, I was talking to Art about uh, he's of Norwegian ancestry, Norwegian and Irish ancestry. And uh, I got to know more about the Norwegian in America. I've had, I live in Oregon, so I've had a couple of students who uh, had me visit up there in northern Oregon on the coast up by Astoria, and they proudly took me to this place. It's like a museum up there. It's a big uh, a building uh, with a, a baseball field and basketball grounds around it, and the big sign said, Sons of Norway. And I realized, well, I wish I could belong to that. You know what I mean? It was like, really? <laughs> and I realized that in every city like L.A., there's pockets. So is there a Norwegian district that I could go to? No, there's a Sons of Norway organization, though. There is an organization. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, we, we remain ignorant of one another. So I'd, I'd be very curious about... Uh, uh, learning from you all. I don't even know where Monrovia is. <laughs> well, I mean, why would I go to Monrovia? Uh, I mean, you, you, I guess you know what I'm talking about, but I don't know. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just from Fresno, California. And, um, you know, you don't know where that is either, but it's kind of like, a, it's, it's a distant, it's a distant suburb. Um, I'll share uh, what his art suggested that I do is a little bit of the poem that I wrote for uh, for Yosh. And uh, as I was explaining earlier, what had happened was like, um, this was at a conference in uh, uh, at, at the Heart Mountain site in the, in the early 90s. And uh, I was walking around with the guys who made that film of Yosh answering 
uh, questions about his past. And we were looking for filming sites and everything. And we were out in the field of the actual uh, concentration camp site. And over here, I said, oh, there's Yosh and his wife. And what he was doing was he was walking around in the field because everything's been pretty much wiped out now where the camp was. And he had a, a notebook and he was looking off in the distance. I said, what's he looking at? Well, he was looking at the actual Heart Mountain, which is off in the distance. And I realized what he was doing was he was trying to find the location that as a teenage kid, he had sketched the mountain. He was an, an aspiring artist. And I thought it was so moving that here he, he was trying to share it with his wife. And, uh, and there was something so positive about what he was doing that I realized that it, this was like a spiritual journey he was on to recapture the past, share it with someone, and stay positive about it. And you couldn't help but noticing that the sun was shining on Heart Mountain, and it was actually a very beautiful sight. You know, there were like antelopes running around, and uh, it, was, it was just wonderful. So I was so taken by it that I, I, I wrote this poem. And uh, I, I've thought about it since, and I think you could tell from seeing Yosh that he was a very sensitive person, and he was also a, a very spiritual person. And in doing the sketch that he wanted to resketch that mountain again, it was it was to me it was like it was an acknowledgement of, uh, uh, of of spirituality and a sense of of uh, being with the earth and feeling good about it. And so I had to write the poem. So this is just the ending part. This time, though, Yosh is strolling over a freshly plowed and fenceless field with that very same sketchbook, searching through the decades to find that rightful place in relation to the mountain, wanting to show his wife where the drawing happened, where that quiet young man sank to his knees in reverence for the mountain, in silent celebration for that vision of beauty that evokes such wonder, such a sunrise of inspiration, wisdom, and compassion, that the line drew itself, making its way with conviction in the direction it knew to be right across the space on paper. And yes, yes, the heart, the eye, the mind testify, this is right. Here, Yosh, hold up the drawing, behold the mountain. Trust the judgment upholding truth through time as the man, the mountain, the profile make a perfect fit in this right place and time. For Yosh to kneel again, feel again, raise his radiant eyes in peace to face the radiant mountain, heart mountain, heart mountain, and begin again with confidence to draw the line. And of course, I use that phrase, what he was doing, drawing the line, in a symbolic way to represent the fact that, yes, he, he drew the line. He drew the line, and this is where it was regarding his sense of conviction and his conscience. It's interesting uh, about this book that uh, as long as I've been involved with this book, it's, it's been decades uh, working with Yosh, and he was writing it, and it was very inspiring to see him writing it because he involved his, uh, his wife, he involved his, his kids got involved in, in helping to uh, type things up for him and get things Xerox and shaped up. That uh, uh, when I received the book, the book in its manuscript form, I realized, boy, this, uh, as you'll find when you read the book, this is really a very, very well-written book. And here's this person that uh, was, I think he could have been a writer. I think he, he, he was an artist also, as far as a visual artist was concerned, but he had to work his way and earn his way and pretty much become a self-taught person. 
at the same time, he was very level-headed and he had this perception, this sensitivity that uh, I think uh, when I read the book, I realized certain things about him that I didn't especially know. So I'd just like to share a couple of little things from the book that uh, won't give anything away, but it'll give you a sense of uh, the kind of person he is that uh, makes, makes the literature so easy to read as you go along. For instance, he and his family were looking for a house uh, to buy. And uh, this is a description of it. After several weeks, and this is after the war, after several weeks, we found a fairly decent clapboard house with a stone foundation and handsome stone front porch of mid-twenties vintage. It had two bedrooms and one bath, all quite roomy, with hardwood floors throughout. The interior decor was typical craftsman style with built-in cabinets of varnished wood and glass doors. Our heavy, round, solid oak dining table would finally find a space worthy of its classic character. The property actually a lot and a half it had at the far end of the adjacent half lot sat a tired, easily overlooked wooden house with a sagging roof, a turn-of-the-century single-bedroom relic which was originally supplied with a gas light. It had since been wired for electricity. The small bathroom had a toilet with a wooden tank up by the ceiling with the brass pull chain. The cast iron bathtub was supported by four cast iron lion's claws. The linoleum covered floor sagged conveniently to one corner where someone had drilled a hole for easy drainage. It was a priceless museum piece if one could hold it together long enough to move it. All the space in front of the bungalow would become Mama's garden. We may have paid a bit more than market value for it, but Mama and Papa felt comfortable there. We were not too far from where we had lived before moving to Monrovia. Soon after we moved in, the whole white neighborhood seemed to flee in panic, and many Nihonjin were able to join us. Imagine Mama, the notorious blockbuster. <coughs> When he describes uh, having to make a living after, after the war, uh, he went into his uh, father's profession of being a gardener. And the wonderful thing about being a gardener, I guess, is, uh, is that uh, it, it's, if there's anything that's a Japanese-American profession, it's being a gardener. And who's more of a of uh, of uh, of an icon than the old Japanese gardener, so uh, he he had to then join his dad and work with him, and then eventually went on to become his own person like that. But uh, let's see, where was that? Uh, the thing about Yosh is that when you when you uh, see him and you get to meet him that way, it's inspiring because here was a person who went through a lot and who had his life pretty much disrupted uh, when he was, he was pretty much a, a, a kid from L.A. who was put into camps. But through it all, he was a very, very level-headed person. And to me, it's very, very inspiring that uh, instead of uh, having any kind of sense of uh, a heaviness of grudges or something. He had a very, very light heart and it was very humorous about things. And one thing I wanted to mention just in passing was he mentioned in the book the word shikataganai several times and he describes it as being a saying in Japanese that goes like nothing can be done. But the way he said it and the way he uses it uh, will convey the feeling of it's not anything that 
you feel that the people are being defeated and beat back down and they're saying, oh, woe is me, nothing can be done. Instead, it fits very much with, to me, what was going on over there in the museum today, go for broke. Kushikata ganai, when you say it, it's more like, hey, that's the way the cookie crumbles. What can you do about it? That's how it goes. Now, let's see what we can really do to get things going again. Go for broke. And so to me, this whole sense of, uh, uh, in Japanese America, is something that the people, even though we've been through moments where we seem to be separated from ourselves and the community seem to be split up. I feel the whole thing has now come together very much with the publication of this book. And so I certainly want to encourage you to uh, buy it and read it. And I noticed today in the bookstore over there, in the gift store, that uh, they have a lot of books. It seems like every year new books are still coming out about the camp experience, and new things come out on TV about the camp experience. And I noticed that there weren't that many books from the woman's perspective, which is very crucial because one of the most important books about the whole experience is uh, by Yosh, Yosh's friend, uh, Michi Weglin. And so I wanted to encourage you to look for Michi's book, uh, Years of Infamy, and as a companion to this book, I'd say there's a book by Toyo Suemoto that has been overlooked, but she was a brilliant person and a colleague of, of Yoshis. And her book is called I Call to Remembrance. I Call to Remembrance. It was published by the uh, Rutgers University Press several years ago, and I guess it's because it was from back east. It hasn't taken hold on the west, but I wanted to uh, 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 mention it to you because I think you'll find it very interesting. And regarding uh, an essay, I also wanted to inform you that uh, uh, living locally before and even after the war, and also a person who was sent to the Heart Mountain camp, is a, a Zen master called Nyogen Senzaki. Nyogen Senzaki. And I think you'll, you'll find his work, he has two recent books out, Niogen Senzaki, uh, he was a Zen master, and at the time, he was practically unknown living here in Japantown. But it seems that as the whole sense of Japanese culture has got on, caught on, so I think has Zen Buddhism. And so on a related note, uh, from the Issei perspective, I wanted to mention to you the work of Niogen Senzaki. So at any rate, uh, I look forward to meeting you and talking with you about what you're doing. Always, always a pleasure to, to, to hear him speak. I mean, Lawson is just a wonderful speaker the first time I heard him was in, uh, it was a conference that was in Salt Lake City in, in 1983, and and uh, I, he was leading a session in one of the classrooms, and I, I walked around looking for him, and all I could hear was a person who spoke in a very strong African-American, you know, intonation, and I walked in the room, and it was Lawson, because he grew up in Fresno around so many blacks and Hispanics. The closing element in today's event will consist of a question and answer dialogue between you, the audience, and a panel consisting of the following four people, Takashi Hojizaki, Lawson Inada, Gail Koromiya, and myself. And uh, so uh, let's proceed with that then. I'm Kristen Hayashi. I'm director of collections and a curator at the Japanese American National Museum. And I will be um, facilitating the Q&A so I just wanted to acknowledge that um, Yosh Kermia's family is here. So I wonder if maybe you could stand or wave so everyone can, can see you. <laughs> I 
And then also in the audience today, we have Frank Abe, who's the director and producer of Conscience and the Constitution. Is Frank here? No? Okay. Okay. And then um, I, th I think we, it was mentioned earlier today, but it was from a member of the audience. So the, our online audience didn't get to hear. But very fittingly, today's Google Doodle um, features Kiyoshi Kuromiya. So, Mumai. Very fitting. Yes. Okay, so for the Q&A portion, um, for those of you who are here in the audience, um, Elizabeth will be bringing out a mic if you have a question, or you can text your question uh, to this number, and then I will read out your question. And then to our Zoom audience, please feel free to text your question to 213-632-6531. Do have questions? I'll ask a warm-up question as Elizabeth makes her way up uh, to, to take a question. So um, I just wanted to, to mention that the Japanese American National Museum and Japanese American Stories just partnered with StoryFile. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we did a very extensive interview of Takashi Hoshizaki. It was about a 25-hour interview. Um, we asked probably close to a thousand questions. And the idea is that visitors to Janum and to Heart Mountain will be able to, to have a conversation with Takashi and learn about more about his experience. So part of my question, I think, is that um, being an objects person, you know, now we have this book-length memoir that talks about um, Yosh Kermia's experience. Um, we saw clips of a Densho interview. Now we'll have Takashi's interview, but maybe to the people on the panel, can you talk more about um, um, other types of artifacts or interviews that are available to tell the draft resistor um, story? Because we know that this is such an under um, studied topic, a lesser known um, part of, of, our, of our experience. And so I wonder if maybe you can talk about the types of artifacts or um, interviews that are available to help tell the 300, you know, in draft resistors um, stories. Well, uh, when I was uh, finally arrested, uh, in Heart Mountain for not uh, reporting to the draft call. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll go a little bit earlier than that. Uh, the I was working at the engineering department at that time. And uh, uh, when the draft, when I received my draft notice, then I decided that I, uh, at that time, I would not be answering the uh, call for the physical exam. and. And the people at the engineering department uh, uh, knew that I had uh, refused to answer the draft call. So I was still working in there, and about a couple of weeks later, one of the uh, fellow workers uh, came up to me and said, well, um, <clears throat> I don't think it would be kind of wise to uh, continue working here. And the reason he said that, unfortunately, one of the Caucasian, excuse me, Caucasian member's son was killed in, in the war. So I thought, well, that's, that's uh, I'm very sad to hear. And so then I just did not go to work. And and then about a week or so later, the FBI then came around to uh, pick me up. And it was around about 6.30 in the morning. And, and uh, uh, as um, I was getting ready to leave, uh, um, my mother uh, handed me uh, a little spiral notebook and a pencil, uh, plus uh, a sweater to keep me warm. And so I had this no little spiral notebook. And as the day went on, I said, well, OK. You, I, I sat down and uh, wrote little notes about what was happening. And uh, I'm not a. A great writer like Yosh, so if you look at the the little journal, journal or the diary that I, I uh, made from the time that I was arrested to the uh, to the end of the trial, uh, it, you just find little notes like, well, well you know, so and so did that, or uh, uh, what. We, and one of the things is that I, I guess I love to eat, and so it's always writing down. Uh, what kind of food we were getting, and it went all <laughs> kind of a pretty bad type of a uh, menu there. 
And so anyway, um, I didn't think much more about it. And then years later, uh, I found uh, that uh, that little spiral notebook in some of my things. And I thought, oh, well, this thing might, you know, I didn't think much about it. And then suddenly it occurred to me, I said, well, wait a minute now. This might be uh, of interest to people to find out or to, to see what happened uh, to me after I was arrested and through the time that uh, we had our trial. So anyway, that uh, particular little spiral notebook is part of the collection at uh, Heart Mountain, Wyoming. I know this is mostly about the draft resistors, but I'm always curious if there were women who helped to support this movement and how they did it, or if, if there were women involved. Um, it seems like there should be. And um, also to what extent women's participation was in any other kind of uh, resistance movement in the camps. On, on a personal level, um, my name is Gail Karamia, and I'm one of Yosha's four daughters. And just with, uh, with that, within our family, um, and I forgot to acknowledge my mom, Haru Karamia, um, she and dad were married shortly after the war. And so mom was the one who raised our family pretty much um, and supported dad while he built his career in landscape architecture. Um, and then his third wife, Irene, was very instrumental in helping dad write his manuscript. She, was, she would take his cryptic longhand writing and type it in um, and, you know, send me copies. And um, so in that sense, just on a personal level, there were women behind dad. And she drove him around to all the events. <laughs> Hi, my name is Martha. I was a good friend of the draft resistors also. And a lot of the draft resistors were bachelors at that time. They were young. They were not married. So um, the mothers I know were very, uh, you know, at that time it was very it was a, a stigma to go into prison. Um, I know with Frank Emmy, who was one of the leaders of the draft resistance movement at Heart Mountain, his marriage broke up later on. Uh, Jimmy O'Mara's. Uh, <laughs> his marriage broke up also after his wife took on. I think she took on three jobs, was it? Right. She took on three jobs to raise money to pay for his legal bills because none of the writers that Jimmy supported before the war sent any money. Um, I think the mothers actually did get together to raise money to, for the legal funds also. So the uh, mothers were supportive, but not in a outright way because you're not going to want to have a <laughs> prisoner, somebody who went to prison as a son. And that was another thing with Kiyoshi's mother, um, Yosha's um, sister-in-law, who resented Yosh for going into prison. And it was uh, some of those, it would cause a lot of problems between the families. OK, we have a question from someone in our online audience. The question is, hi, Art. How much work did you have to do on Yosha's first draft? to get it into shape for publication. What kinds of suggestions did you make to him? Uh, I don't think that I had to do very much work on, on his draft. It was, so, it was so well written. It was just a question of doing you know, some copy editing. And, and then uh, where there were problematic uh, conclusions that he drew, I was able to, to use Eric Muller's uh, uh, critique of, of his manuscript. That, and, and, this was mostly on legal questions, constitutional questions and everything. And so uh, I thought that Yosh would be taking the task for it if, he, if it went in the book on question or on challenge. And so, so I was able to, to, to hitchhike off of, of, uh, uh, of Eric's sort of knowledge. But no, it, 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 was, it was a non-problematic 
book largely to, to edit. I mean, it was a pleasure to do. The family had already done a lot of stuff on it and getting into into shape. Mainly it was, for me, it was like writing the introduction and, and for getting, you know, Lawson to, to contribute the afterward and, 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 and Frank, uh, you know, Chin to, for his, his epigraph at the beginning of the book and stuff like this. But no, it was, it, it was a, I think it was, a, for me, I would call it a slam dunk. I mean, I worked 20 years on Jimmy O'Moore's uh, you know, editing uh, O'Mora's material, and and I and I, I probably worked hard for a couple of months on, on doing this, so it was really a big difference. You know, I mean, O'Mora's memoir is about twice as, as long as as, as Yosha's, so that was a that was a huge difference too. And and I had boxes and boxes of of, of materials uh, on on uh, uh, that, that O'Mora has. And, and when you were talking about artifacts and stuff, one of the things I did was I. I got my wife taught the library and information science at San Jose State, and and at Cal State Fullerton both. And uh, I had her archives classes archived the uh, Omora papers, and so all of those papers were archived and ordered and stuff. And uh, they're all up at Stanford University, so there's that material there that is able to draw. And so I, I thank very much my wife who has been a tremendous help in everything that I've been able to to accomplish. Um, I'd, I'd li like to go back a little bit about the women or the ladies that uh, that helped out in, in uh, during the time that uh, we were in the, uh, held in, in the county jails before the trial. Uh, one of the girlfriends of the one of the resistors uh, had actually written to a very uh, prominent. Radio uh, broadcaster, newscaster at that time, and I'm trying to remember his name. I think it was Walter Winchell, and she explained. Uh, wrote a letter to uh, Walter Winchell uh, about the 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 res resistors trying at least to get some publicity as one of the things that we were trying to do with the trial, but then uh, no word, no response, or anything else. And I began to wonder in later years that whether there may have been a, a general uh, word passed around uh, newscasters, not to mention the fact that there were Japanese, Japanese American citizens that were all held in what we are now calling the concentration camps. So I just wanted to back up and talk more about that, where, where the ladies that help, help us try to help us out. Okay, we have another question. This one is from Corey Shiozaki. How is presidential pardon from Truman for exonerating the Fair Play Committee made possible? Uh, he just had some advisors that actually, uh, you know, told him that this would be a, a very smart move on his behalf. And so in 1947, he did that. And, uh, you know, and so that, of course, was a great thing for for the draft resistors because they they now were exonerated for for their behavior and I say and say in a sense what it was saying that they were justified in doing what they did, so I mean I think it was a, a, an action that, that that had tremendous consequences and, and long range consequences and when you start talking about Harry Truman who was an underrated president for so long and now maybe is even an overrated president. Uh, Truman actually is, 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 at least from my perspective, as somebody doing Japanese American history, his, his reputation goes up a great deal for that act that he took. The only way that Yosh found out that he was uh, exonerated was through, it was published in a newspaper and a friend told him, told Yosh, that they were pardoned and nobody got an individual paper to say, you're free. So he kept thinking that he was a felon and he didn't apply for any other job other than the gardening. So that's how he got the news. Uh, let me add to that. In my particular case, uh, I had become very friendly with the conscientious objectors that we were with us at McNeil Island. And so it was through them that I learned that there was a pardon. And I said, pardon, what's going on here? And 
<laughs> I was not too much in terms of knowing the laws and the Constitution, so I really did not understand what the presidential pardon all meant. But then again, uh, with that pardon, uh, I now became uh, a, a full citizen, which, and I'll continue on a little bit here, being a full citizen, uh, then, then you become also eligible for the draft. A felon is not eligible for the draft. So, so in my case, I became eligible for the draft. And then when I was uh, finishing up my master's at UCLA, I got my second draft notice. <laughs> <laughs> so now, you know, and, and the, in the Fair Play Committee, one of the things that we, we push was the fact that give us our civil rights back and then also we'll, uh, let, let the rest of the family uh, go back to where, they, where we all came from. And so now 10 years later, in fact, I, I was uh, in the same neighborhood that we left and I had my civil rights back. So when the draft notice came, then... I, I, just, I did and, uh, answer the draft call, and so I, I spent uh, two years in the Army, and then someone said, you did double duty, two years in the Federal Penitentiary and two years in the Army. I, I, think, I think it would be very interesting if uh, you could share with us, uh, Takashi, uh, your experience at McNeil Island because it was somewhat different. It was it was a learning experience for you, uh, and if you would re relate what what you learned, the different things that you learned when you were in prison. Well, um, one of my close neighbors was a, a black, and so I had some experience with, with uh, the people uh, in, in, from the black community. But really, growing up. I did not really under, fully understand or fully run into uh, discrimination. But then in the prison, we had a huge, uh, a large, uh, various groups uh, in there. And uh, we had the, uh, the black community was one, and we had the Latino community. And it was there that uh, I had befriended one of the black uh, prisoners and he then uh, began to tell me the story of, of, of really of his life to me. And he was in prison for uh, hijacking a, tr a truck, a semi truck full of liquor. And, the re and he told me, he says, well, the, the, the uh, one, somebody, I guess, in a, a very sophisticated organization, had approached him and uh, and actually gave him uh, this place where this uh, semi truck with liquor was uh, parked. And uh, I guess the understanding was that then he was now to go and, and uh, break into the truck and drive it away and drive it to some spot where now they can then transfer the liquor off and then put it out. And so that was sort of the way that he was able to make a living. And, uh, and talking more with him, I, I realized that it was very hard for the guys uh, in, in the black community to get a, any kind of a job or a good paying job. And so I, I, so I, so I had a pretty good uh, feeling of, of what they were going through. And he even told me that uh, as a kid, when at that time, well, it was a depression, and so when they had a uh, a new store open, generally one of the th ways of attracting the customers was to then have free food to be given out as samples. And he told me that he was out there <clears throat> in the cold, wondering whether he could go in and then partake of the free samples. And so I thought, oh, that never even occurred to me that, that such a situation would exist. And so uh, it, it was, the, the, to me, it was really an, a revelation uh, of uh, talking with all the d different prisoners and, and the various backgrounds and then how they ended up uh, in prison with me. 
Yeah, Tech, would you talk about what you learned about mathematics when you were in the prison and what you learned about playing the piano when you were in prison? <laughs> the, which one? the mathematics that you learned in prison and then also the music, learning to play classical piano. <laughs> oh, well, first on the mathematics, um, when, when uh, we first were entered into the prison, you may uh, have seen the larger building and that uh, and with the old uh, iron bar uh, cells that we were placed in and so we uh, we were there as a group for a little over a month actually we had a, about a week or so earlier at being in quarantine but then while I was there in, in what we call the main prison in the big house I learned that uh, one of the uh, inmates was uh, teaching uh, mathematics, arithmetic and math. And so I said, oh, that's a pretty good deal. So I decided to join his class. <laughs> and then uh, uh, after a few lessons with him, uh, I found out that uh, we weren't going to stay there. Uh, we we're going to be moved out to the farm, uh, which was a low security area. And so that, so I, so I talked to him, and he said, "Oh no, don't worry, we can do it by correspondence." So then, in the uh, rest of the time that uh, I was in prison, uh, I then uh, continued as a correspondence course, and uh, actually ended up uh, you know, doing the uh, advanced algebra and uh, uh, analytical geometry, and I guess. I got to the point of, of the next error it would be calculus, but then by that time I, I was released from the prison. But then um, among uh, the uh, uh, prisoners uh, were musicians, and these musicians then were, I, I guess at that time, I can't quite remember, but uh, I think that they, they were uh, in there for on drug charges, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, so one of the one of the uh, um, black uh, musicians uh, was offering to uh, teach how to play the piano, and, and I thought, well, that was pretty good. Uh, it sounded like a good deal. So then, I I joined the class, and and um, my particular job along the way in in the prison was such that if I uh, I was a janitor at first. And I could then work, work fast and then have about, oh, maybe three, four, five hours of free time. And in that free time, not only was I doing the correspondence course in mathematics, but then also practicing on the piano. And <laughs> when you practice four or five hours a day on the piano, I got to a point where at least I can bang out such, some sort of music on that. <laughs> OK. I think that's all the time we have today. So can we have a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you all for such a wonderful discussion. Um, for the folks in the audience, we'll be selling copies of Beyond the Betrayal in the lobby and be having a autograph session as well. Um, so thank you all for joining us today and have a good one. <laughs>